Well, hey, Waynesburg family, we are so grateful and thankful that we get to gather again on a Sunday morning uh, to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that we are gathered in various places, uh, but we are uh, together in spirit before the Lord. And I really, truly believe that the Lord uh, continues to meet with us each and every week. He has been so, so faithful to us. Um, we are looking forward this month to unpacking a new sermon series. It's called How to Be a Good News Home in a Bad News World. And obviously there's lots of, uh, of bad news out there, uh, but we're looking forward to uh, what it looks like to not just reflect the bad news that, that we're being surrounded with, but to reflect the good news that we find uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're looking forward to unpacking that for the next few weeks and hope that you'll uh, will join us for each and every one of these uh, Sundays as we uh, walk through this series. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, uh, we're going to have some music. We're going to unpack uh, some principles from Psalm 62. We're going to have communion uh, after that, and then we're going to have a closing song. So thanks again for being with us.
in the dust at the foot of the cross where mercy So there's this scene uh, that takes place at the end of the book of Joshua. So um, God's people uh, had been in slavery in Egypt, and Moses led them out of slavery. And they, they wandered around in, in the desert for, for 40 plus years. For 40 years, they were out there. <clears throat> God finally brought them into the promised land, the, 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 the land that he had promised them. And they are finally getting ready to settle into this promised land at the end of of the book of Joshua, Joshua 24. And Joshua gathers all the people together. He gathers all the people together before they spread out to their homes. And he says uh, to them, they've got to make a choice. He says that he encourages them to be faithful to the Lord and to serve the Lord, uh, who has brought them out of Egypt, who has brought their, their forefathers and their families uh, through the desert and finally into this promised land. And he says to them uh, to choose the Lord, to serve the Lord faithfully. Uh, and then he says in verse 15, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And he goes on and he says, you know, um, if you think serving the Lord is undesirable, choose this day who you will serve. You can either serve those, uh, those false idols, those false gods that, that we used to worship, or you can choose to serve the one true living God who has brought us into this land. And he says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You see, Joshua uh, brought God's people together in order to say, look, we've got a choice and a decision to make. We can either uh, fall back into old habits and old patterns and, and worshiping old idols, or we can continue to move forward in faith, serving and loving the God who brought us into this land. And he said that that issue, that, that, that issue had been settled. That issue had been decided for him. And he said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And as we, we start this new sermon series uh, called How to Be a Good News Home in a Bad News World, uh, we also have some decisions to make. And obviously, um, that first uh, decision that we have to make is a, is a decision for faith. Uh, the, the, as we walk through this series... Um, we have chosen, we have decided that in the midst of all the bad news, in the midst of the sea of bad news that's out there about this, this COVID-19 virus, uh, the sea of bad news uh, uh, about uh, health, about um, people passing away, uh, about jobs and financial insecurity and stability in our economy, in the midst of this sea of bad news, uh, we've got a choice to make. In our homes where we've been, you know, confined to for the most part, you know, it, as we're home spending all this time together, are we going to be homes that reflect that bad news back to our families and out into the world around us? Or are we going to be homes where we reflect the good news of Jesus Christ? Because I'm telling you, Jesus is bigger than this virus. Jesus is bigger than our financial insecurity. Jesus is bigger than all of this. And so in our homes, we've got a choice to make. Are we going to be a, a house that reflects the bad news? Or are we going to be a house that reflects the good news of Jesus? Well, I hope that today you can settle that question really fast and say, yes, I've decided, we have decided that we're going to be a good news home. Just like Joshua, uh, just you can echo what Joshua says. As for me and my house, I, I can't make everybody do um, things the way that we do them. And there may be some people uh, that look at, at the scriptures or look at faith and say, you know what? Uh, that is undesirable for me. But as for me and my house, we're choosing to serve the Lord. We're choosing to make our household a place of good news. And as we start our series today, uh, we're going to be looking at a circumstance and a situation that, that, that David finds himself in, in Psalm 62. And David in Psalm 62 is not living through a pandemic, 
Uh, but he is living through a very stressful time. And so uh, how, how does he deal with that stress? How does he find rest? How does he find peace in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the, of the difficulty? Well, we're going to unpack a couple of principles uh, from Psalm 62 uh, that, that show us how David uh, responded to his trial and his difficulty. And if we can take those principles and reflect those into our homes, then we will surely be uh, good news homes in the midst of this bad news <clears throat> world. Um, many of you know uh, our kids, the Vanderbilt kids, and, and the youngest Vanderbilt child is, Emma, is <clears throat> excuse me, is Emma Grace. And uh, Emma Grace loves to talk, and we love to talk to Emma Grace. Um, but one of the things that we know about Emma Grace is that when it gets late in the day, and she starts getting tired, uh, she either gets frantic in activity just to try to move so she doesn't fall asleep, or she gets frantic with her words and talks a lot so that she doesn't fall asleep. Well, what we find in Psalm 62 is that um, David's mouth and his activity might not be frantic, but inside his soul is frantic. Inside his heart is frantic and restless, and he's finding, uh, finding it hard to have peace in the midst of his circumstances. And, and David tells us uh, that, that in the midst of, of this difficulty, in the midst of this, this, this situation where it might be difficult to find peace, there is a place where our souls can be quieted. There is a place where our souls can find rest. Because when we're stressed, our souls typically get restless. When, when we're stressed, our, our hearts typically um, uh, are without peace. And we can, we can wake up in the middle of the night with worry, or we can worry ourselves throughout the day uh, with, with restless chatter in our souls. Uh, that restless chatter may, may show up with, with thoughts like this. What are we going to do? Things need to change. And we play out all sorts of different scenarios in our heads that if it doesn't happen this way, or if it doesn't happen that way, then all will be lost. Well, David tells us there is a place to quiet our chattering souls, and there is a place of rest in the midst of the chaos. And in Psalm 62, he tells us how to find peace and rest in the sea of bad news. Now, we're going to look at several of the passages here, but I want to focus in on uh, verses 5 through 8. This is what uh, David says. He says, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and he is my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Now, that first phrase uh, where, where David says, find rest, O my soul, in God alone, is also very similar to verse 1, which says, my soul finds rest in God alone. Now, now verses 1 and verses 5 of this psalm speak to rest. <clears throat> and they speak to rest. And oftentimes when we think about rest, we think of, you know, working hard all day long, coming home tired, and finally getting uh, to be able to rest. Well, what David is talking about isn't necessarily uh, resting after a hard day's work, but he's speaking to uh, a restlessness, a chattering in, a, in his soul. And these, these, two, these two verses, verses 1 and verse 5, uh, the English translation is used rest in both, in both verses, but there's actually a different Hebrew word used in verse 1 than there is in verse 5. Verse 1 says, my soul finds rest in God alone. But the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew phrase there uh, means this. It's a, it, the translation would be, surely to God, silence my soul. And so rest in verse 1 speaks to silence, to quiet. And then in verse 5, he says, find rest of my soul in God alone again. And the Hebrew translation, the literal translation is, surely to God, Stand still, my soul. And so in verse 1, it's silence my soul. In verse 5, it's stand still, my soul. But either way, we see that David's heart, David's soul is restless. 
He is without peace, and he needs to come to the Lord to find silence for his chattering heart and soul, and he needs to come to the Lord to find stillness and peace for his soul. David speaks to the restlessness of the soul, and, and God is really the prescription to that restlessness. The Lord is good news in the midst of bad news and challenging circumstances. Well, how do we find this rest? How do we find this peace? David really has two principles that we can gather from Psalm 62. The first principle is this. <clears throat> you can trust God no matter what. You can trust God no matter what. When, when we want to become good news homes in a bad news world, this first principle is so important for us to impart to our kids and to our families. You can trust God no matter what. Now, th this, this, this psalm has so much to say about the Lord, uh, but before I get to what it says about the Lord, it, it also gives us a few somber warnings, I would like to say. Because uh, David, um, David is warning us about some things that we don't want to trust in. We're going to get to the good part where it says how we can trust in the Lord and to focus on the Lord. But we also need to be aware of our propensity to trust in some other things. Uh, we need to be aware of our bent towards turning away from God and turning towards other things for our hope and for our peace. Well, quickly, uh, there's three things here that, that David says, you know, you don't want to misplace your hope and put them in these things. The first one is people. Uh, people aren't always going to be for you. And uh, some people will actually want you to fail. And so David is telling us, you know what? Don't misplace your hope. Don't put your hope in people. In verse three, he, he talks about um, how uh, these other people want to throw him down. That they see David as a leaning wall or a tottering fence that they can go and push over and topple over. In verse four, he says, they fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths, they bless, but with their hearts, they curse. And so there are some people in David's life who may give him um, praise with their lips or honor with their lips, but in their hearts, they're really cursing him. Now, we don't know the exact circumstance of when David uh, wrote this psalm, but scholars tell us that there are actually two, um, two likely scenarios. Uh, the first one comes in 2 Samuel chapters 1 through 4 after Saul passes away. After Saul dies, and after Saul dies, who was the reigning king, um, then David is, is, is you know, declared uh, the throne uh, and given the throne as God's appointed king of Israel. And so uh, scholars tell us that David during this time is either writing the psalm after the death of Saul when Saul's forces try to continue his dynasty and dethrone David as God's appointed king, or later on in 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 18, when David's own son, Absalom, uh, tries and attempts a military coup to throw David off the throne and install himself on the throne as Israel's king. Either way, these are not good circumstances. These are, try these are trying circumstances. And in both of these circumstances, there are people who are opposing David. And David's got a choice to make. Will people that are maybe not, that are dishonest with the words and dishonest in their heart, uh, will, will these people that bless him with their mouths and that curse them in their hearts, uh, will these people be able to steal David's peace? Will these people be able to steal, to steal David's joy? Will they be able to steal David's rest? Well, uh, David tells us that we cannot misplace our hope and hope in people. Because they will ultimately fail us. And there are even going to be some that radically oppose us. The other thing that we can't uh, misplace, misplace our hope in is in position. In verse 9, David says, Lowborn men are but a breath, the highborn are but a light. If weight on a balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. And so David says, position will fail you. Your status in standing before others at best is very, very fragile, but before God doesn't mean anything. 
And so God doesn't uh, care about our, 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 or God is not impressed with our social status. In, in, in God's eyes, it doesn't matter if we're low-born men or high-born men. Our status and our position do not matter. So we should not trust in our status and in our position. The third thing that Davis tells us and warns us against misplacing our hope in is in power. Now, this is an interesting verse. He says, do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen riches. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. And so David warns it against extortion. Well, what is extortion? I looked it up on dictionary.com. It says that extortion is the crime of obtaining money or some other thing of value by the abuse of one's office or authority. And so David says, uh, you know, David warns and says, uh, because you have a position of power or authority, because you hold a high office, doesn't mean you should abuse the powers of that office to extort and gain value, valuable things for yourself. And he says, you know, do not take pride in stolen goods. Do not set your heart on riches. Do not set your heart on these things. Well, think about David's life. And, 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 and obviously, uh, on, on this side of history, we can look back and, and see the big picture of David's life. Well, there, there's a, a part of David's life that is, uh, that is a warning as well, uh, a season of his life where, where he did not choose wisely and where his life is actually a warning against this thing that he's preaching against. In 2 Samuel uh, chapters 11 and 12, we read about this transgression that David has with Bathsheba. And in uh, 2 Samuel 11 verse 1 is so interesting and it starts out the scene, the scenario, by saying it, it was in the spring... At the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, David was supposed to be out. He was supposed to be, it says, during the spring when kings go out to war. Uh, David's responsibility was not to be back in Israel. Uh, David's responsibility was to be out with his men. So David wasn't where he belonged. And because David wasn't where he, was, we, where he would belong, and because David wasn't fulfilling his responsibilities, temptation came into his life. And he sees Bathsheba bathing uh, on a rooftop, and he's overtaken by lust. And that's, you know, th there's a different sermon for, for, for lust for a different day. But this is such a, a, a true picture because oftentimes lust comes in when people linger where they don't belong. And David uh, has this, this scene where, in this scenario that just uh, runs kind of out of control. The, the scene of the scenario runs out of control, and David wasn't where he was supposed to be. He makes a choice that quickly spirals out of his control, and his status as king, his power to extort, manipulate, and lie all fail him, and his reign as king is never, ever the same. And so take the somber warning that David gives us in Psalm 62. Take the somber warning not to misplace our hope in people, misplace our hope in position, misplace our hope in power, but to turn and to trust in the Lord. We cannot trust in people, power, position. These are all a somber warning for us. But the theme of this psalm, the theme of this psalm is not just a warning against those things. But it also gives us a powerful principle to look at who God is and to set our hearts on him. To set our hope on who God is. You see, David had come to believe and, and David and, and we need to decide that we can trust God no matter what. In the midst of this, this terrible circumstance that David is walking through, in the midst of this a stressful time that he is walking through. It, he is setting his hope on who God is. Uh, this psalm, uh, in this psalm, David piles up these descriptions of God over and over in his psalm. And that, and that really gets to why we can trust God. Why can we trust God? Because of who he is. Because of what he has done. Because of who, what, what his character is. 
And David piles up these descriptions. He says uh, in verses 2, 6, and 7, God, you are my rock. You are my secure foundation. And again, think about the, the story that, that Jesus told about the man, the wise man who built his house upon the rock. He says that there's a man who, who built his house on the sand. And when the storms of life came and, and beat and battered against his house, uh, the, the man's house who was built on a foundation of sand crumbled. But he said the man who built his house upon the rock, that man's house stood the test of the storms and the trials of life. And David is saying the same thing. God, you are my rock in verses 2, 6, and 7. God, you are my rock. You are my secure foundation. He says in verse 2 and 6, God, you are my salvation. You are the one who delivers me. Um, you know, he says also, God, you are my fortress in verses 2 and 6. You're, 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 a fortress is a place of security and safety. God, you're my place of security. In verses 7 and 8, he says, God, you are my refuge. You are my shelter. And then I, I love uh, verses 11 and 12. Listen to, to this other description that, that God says. Uh, I'm sorry, that David says about God. He says, one thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. This is a, a Hebrew play on words. It would be similar to if, if uh, we said in, uh, the phrase, um, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. It, it really speaks to a, a thing that was said many, many times. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, that you, O oh God, are strong and that you, O oh God, are loving. Look at that description that, that, that David gives of God. He says, you're my rock, you're my salvation, you're my fortress, you're my refuge. God, you're the one who is strong and loving. And I know that we're just on the, the other side of Easter, but Easter is the perfect demonstration of a God that is strong and loving. Because on the cross, on Good Friday, Jesus went to the cross and he paid the penalty for my life, or he paid the penalty for my sin. He laid down his life for me. On the cross, Jesus pays the ransom price of sin with his life to set me and you free. That is love. But on Easter Sunday, Jesus proved his power. Jesus proved his strength. On Easter Sunday, Jesus demonstrates his strength, God's strength, by raising from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death and hell. So this God that... that that David is worshiping is strong and loving. And when we see uh, God's strength and we see God's love most, um, most excellently portrayed in Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. When we place our faith and trust in Jesus, he rescues us from our sin, adopts us into his family. He is so, so good. So what do, what do you and I need to do? What do you and I need to do when the storms of life start, start hitting us? What do you and I need to do when the world is full of bad news? What do you and I need to do for our families when, when you turn on the TV, you turn on the internet, you, you turn on the radio, and you're, and you're just inundated with bad news over and over and over again. Well, we need to do what David did. Because what David is doing in these verses is he's preaching to himself about the character of God. And so you and I need to get into the habit of preaching to ourselves about the goodness of God, about the greatness of Jesus. When you set your heart on who Jesus is, you can find uh, the good news that you've been looking for. Jesus is the rest for your restlessness. Jesus is the hope for your storm. Jesus is the one that you can trust no matter what. And Jesus tells us that even the things that steal our peace and rob our rest have been overcome in him. His triumph over death and the grave is the epicenter of hope and freedom that you and I can, can have if we will believe God's love, if we will believe God's power. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. 
being a good news home in a bad news world starts with that step of faith that says, you can trust God no matter what. The second principle that we get uh, uh, from, this, from this psalm, uh, the second principle we get for being a good news home in a bad news world is this. You can bring everything to God, especially the hard stuff. I love verse 8. Verse 8 to me is the verse that connects everything happening in this passage. Uh, he says in verse 8, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. David has just gone through. He's done pre he, he has preached to himself. Find rest, O my soul. Find rest, O my soul. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He's my rock. He's my salvation. He's my fortress. He's my refuge. He's just got done preaching to himself, and then he turns uh, <laughs> his attention, not just to himself. Now he's preaching outward. And he says, trust in him at all times, you people. Trust in him at all times, oh people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Jesus, or I'm sorry, David is telling us that we can go to the Lord in all times. And we can pour out before God everything in our hearts. What David is doing here isn't just uh, preaching to us, but David is also teaching us how to pray. And David's uh, teaching us how to pray in really two steps. And that first step is to pour out your heart. Is to pour out your heart. Now, I, I'm, I brought a glass. I want you to picture that this glass is your heart, this glass is your soul. And I brought some strawberry soda. This is sensational strawberry. And um, I don't really care for a sensational strawberry. So we're going to act like this is the, the, the hard things that invade our soul, the hard things that invade our life, the hard things that fill us up. This is the bad news that we're ingesting all the time, especially in these days. And David here uses this phrase, pour out your hearts to the, to the Lord. Trust in him at all times and pour out your hearts to him. Well, that Hebrew word um, for pouring out describes a complete emptying. It's not a partial pouring out, but it is a complete pouring out of liquid with no reserve and nothing held back. And so David is teaching us uh, to pray. And the first thing that we do in prayer is that we pour out our hearts before God. We pour out all the junk. We pour out the discouragement. We pour out the fear. We pour out the hurt. We pour out the anxiety. We pour it out before the Lord and we empty, empty our hearts out to him. And just as a side note, I think that it's really important for us to pour out our hearts to God, especially uh, because, on, on behalf of those that we love or because of those we love. Because if we don't pour out our stress and our anxiety and our hurts and our disappointments, if we don't pour those things out before the Lord, we're often going to spew those things out to those closest to us. And so pouring our hearts out before Lord, the Lord isn't just good for our heart and our soul, but it's good for our family, too. And the second step uh, to this is, so in the, the first step is pouring out your heart to God. And the second step is this. I need to fill my heart with truth. I need to fill my heart with truth. Now, I don't like sensational strawberry, but I love Dr. Pepper. And maybe I've been in quarantine a little bit too long, but I love Dr. Pepper and have grown to love Dr. Pepper even more. And so I'm going to say that Dr. Pepper represents... Uh, the, the good things, the truth that we need to let God pour back into us after we've poured out our hearts to him. You see, David is teaching us how to pray. The first step is to pour out your hearts to God, pour out your hurts, your, your, your anxieties, your difficulties, your fears, pour those out to him and then let God fill up your heart and let God fill up your soul with his truth. Because we don't just need to preach the truth. Remember, we, we, the, we talked just a few moments ago about preaching the truth to ourselves about who God is. 
But now we also need to not just preach the truth to ourselves about who God is. We need to pray the truth to ourselves about who God is. God, you are my rock. You are my secure foundation. So God, I want to build my life on you. God, you are my salvation. You deliver me. God, you can make a way when I don't see a way. God, you're my fortress. You're my source of security. So God, if you are for me, if I really believe, God, that you're for me, that you're my fortress, then I don't need to fear. And God, you are my refuge. You're my shelter. God, in you, I find my rest in the midst of the storm. The pouring out of our hearts, especially the junk, and the praying the truth of who God is, looks so much different than the restless chattering of our souls. And so David here is teaching us how to pray. We've got to pour out our hearts before the Lord. In a world filled with bad news, we can pour out our hearts before the Lord, pour out the junk, and then fill up our hearts with truth, the truth of who God is. And when we do that, then we can step forward in faith. Why? Because we have seen who God is. We have preached to ourselves who God is. We have reminded ourselves in prayer of who God is. And so I can walk forward with encouragement. I can move forward with boldness and confident trust that this, that this Lord, that this Jesus, who is the embodiment of strength and love, he is my rock. He is my salvation. He is my fortress. He is my refuge. He is my refuge. And so David reminds us that we can trust God no matter what. And he also reminds us that we can bring everything to God, especially the hard stuff. And when we do those things, when we start there, that gives us the foundation we need to have a home. The foundation we need to have a good news home in a world full of bad news. Trusting in God no matter what and bringing everything to God, especially the hard stuff. I want to I close with a testimony um, from uh, a, a guy named Ernie Johnson. Uh, Ernie Johnson is a... Um, He's a guy that you might, might have seen on TV, but he works for the uh, TV station TNT, and he works for uh, a, a show called Inside the NBA. And uh, he was one of the hosts for the show Inside the NBA, along with Charles Barkley and Kenny Smith and Shaquille O'Neal. Um, but uh, Ernie Johnson tells the, this story, this, this testimony about two turning points he had in his life. The first turning point was... Um, was th this time at, in his life as an adult where he came to, came to faith in Jesus. He, he trusted Jesus uh, with his life. He put his faith in Jesus and began a relationship with Jesus. So the first turning point uh, that he talks about in this testimony is this moment where, where he trusts Jesus as his, as his Lord and Savior as an adult. And then he goes on to talk about the second turning point that he had in his walk with Christ. And that was six years after he gave his life to the Lord. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer. And Ernie uh, Johnson is, uh, is, has gone to Starbucks and he's eating lunch with his pastor, Kevin. And he says that this meeting with his pastor was a turning point in his life because, um, because God used it in such a powerful way. Listen to what he says. He says... <clears throat> Uh, so now Kevin and I are sitting in the local Starbucks talking about how having a doctor speak one particular C word can pretty much knock your world off its axis. And was it okay that I wanted to punch God right in the nose? We began to unpack what I said I believed. Was this diagnosis going to shake my faith to its core? Or was my faith going to carry me through uh, this difficult trial? Did I truly believe what the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, that in all things God works for the good of those who believe? In times like this, you have a couple of options, Kevin told me. You can turn on God, or you can turn to God. Kevin pulled out a pen from his pocket, grabbed a, a Starbucks napkin, and wrote down one word. Now, this is not a Starbucks napkin, it's a Waynesburg napkin. 
And our, and our napkins are a lot better uh, than Starbucks napkins. But the word uh, that Kevin wrote on that napkin for Ernie Johnson was the word trust. It was this word trust. And he says, you know, in times like this, you've got a couple of, of options. You can uh, look at this word trust and you can put a question mark at the end of it. Or you can look at this word trust and put a period at the end of it. Uh, Kevin uh, went on to say, is it going to be trust with a question mark? Is it going to be, I'll trust you, God, if the next test comes back the way I want it to? Or is it going to be trust God, period, no matter what? You trusted him with your life six years ago. It's easy to trust when things are going great and when you're being blessed with good things left and right. How does that trust feel right now? while you're looking up from this valley that you've never been in. Well, Ernie Johnson said that that was a turning point because uh, from that conversation, he moved forward and decided, he settled in his heart, you know what, I'm going to trust God. Not with a question mark, but I'm going to trust God, period. I'm going to not... I'm not going to let this trial, I'm not going to let this difficulty uh, cause me to turn from God or to turn on God, but I'm going to use this trial and difficulty as an opportunity for me to turn to God. And so Ernie Johnson says that uh, to this day, whenever he sends an email, the signature at the bottom of the message says this, Ernie Johnson Jr., trust God, dot, 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 with the word period spelled out. So it says, Ernie Johnson Jr., trust God, period. And that's what you and I need to do. That's the decision you and I have to make. Uh, will we trust God, period? Or will we trust God, question mark, only when things go the way we think that they should go? David had, it was settled for him. And he preached it to, to, to the people that would listen. He preached it in, in his song. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him because God is our refuge. Many years ago, that, that great leader, King David, made that decision. Made that decision. He settled it in his heart. And the question for you and I is, is, is this. Have we settled that in our hearts? Have we decided to settle this thing with Jesus once and for all? How about you? Maybe the coronavirus is a wake-up call. Maybe some other trial or some other difficulty uh, has been a wake-up call for you. Maybe uh, you just have a deep longing for things to, to, to go back to normal. Maybe you just have a deep longing for, for some sort of wholeness to come out of brokenness, for good news to be, to be real in the midst of all this bad news. Today you can get silent. Today you can get clear. And today you can decide to trust God no matter what. To trust in Jesus, period. And to know that he is one that you can go to and pour out your heart before. And you can trust him to fill your heart back up with the truth that you need to move forward in these difficult days. Wherever you're viewing this, Wherever you at, you need to know that Jesus can give you hope in the midst of the storm. That Jesus can help your home to be a good news home in the midst of a bad news world. And if you've never settled that decision, you can settle that decision today, wherever you're watching this, by praying this simple prayer with me. Jesus, I want to make you my salvation. I want to choose you as my rock and my fortress. I have placed my hope in other things, but today I want to recenter my hope in you. The best I know how, I want to follow you. Lord, may it be so for each and every one of us. Lord, may it be so for each and every one of us that we have recentered our hopes on the Lord Jesus Christ. May it be so for each and every one of us that in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the difficulty, God, that our hope, our peace, our salvation is found in you, O Lord. 
For you are a rock, you're a fortress, you're a, you're a salvation, you're a refuge. And we put our hope in you alone. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So as difficult as it may be living out here in the country um, and being on my own, one of my favorite parts is definitely um, being able to see the sunsets and then the times that we're able to be up and see the sunrise. Because, you know, I love that for the sunset, even as it gets darker at night, we get still, the part that gets us the most is as it gets darker, the sun's light is still shining bright and creating those beautiful colors that we all know. And then the sun rises, no matter how dark it gets, we know we can count on the sun shining through the darkness at some point. Uh, and I bring this up because as I was going through and praying for this communion meditation, this phrase kept coming to mind as we were thinking, as I was thinking through this time as Jesus is with his disciples for the Last Supper, uh, and the phrase of, even in the darkest time, his light shined through. Uh, you know, even as Jesus was drawing close to those moments on the cross, his light shined through as he was with his disciples there, and he broke the bread, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He took why he said, the Jews, he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. And even in those, that time where his darkness, the darkness was starting to creep in, still Jesus' light shined bright, and he showed how it was going to shine even brighter days later is when it seemed all darkness was around and all hope was lost, Jesus came and his light shone through again as he went and he rose from the dead as we've celebrated about a month ago. And so in this time, as we break the bread, we take the bread and we drink the juice this morning, let's just remember that in this time that Jesus is saying that this is his body, which is broken for us, this is blood that was shed for us, so let's just remember that, just a good reminder that even in that darkest time, as it was drawing closer and closer, Jesus' light shone, shined through in that time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder this morning. And we thank you that even as your, the, the world's darkness started creeping in, your light decided to shine bright through your Son. As they took the bread, took the juice that, that evening. Let us remember as we take that bread, which is your body that was broken, take the juice that is your blood that was shed. Let us remember that even in a time like this where darkness may feel like it's trying to creep in, your light will shine bright. Your light will shine through. And let us just remember that as we gather together this morning and just remember what you did on the cross all those years ago. We thank you and we praise you. You my pray. Amen.
Thanks so much for joining us for online worship today. Uh, God is good. And we trust that, we believe that, and we hope in that. And our hope and prayer is that you experience the same joy, you experience the same peace, you experience the same love uh, that we have experienced by trusting in Jesus. There's a link up here at the top right-hand corner of your screen uh, that says Next Steps. If you've got questions about this Jesus stuff, if you want to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, but I, I want to know more, I encourage you to click on that Next Steps link, and it'll walk you through some really great information about who Jesus is and how to be a part of his family. Um, if you have further questions, you're welcome to reach out uh, to, to us here at Waynesburg Christian Church. We'd love to, to share with you. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. And we would love for each and every one of you to know for sure, for sure, for sure that Jesus is your hope, that Jesus is your peace, and that he is your strength in, these, in this day, in these days, and then in the days moving forward. If you have any questions, uh, we would love for you to reach out. We'd love to talk with you. Thanks again for joining us. Have a blessed week.